So uh, I'm going to hand over to Claire, uh, but just let me just tell you a little bit about her. Um, she's based in Glasgow. She's a multidisciplinary artist. Uh, since 2005, she's developed a unique movement vocabulary based on her use of crutches, a choreographic approach often rooted in the use, misuse, study, and distortion of crutches. She's one of the UK's leading disabled artists, I would say the world's disabled artist, and internationally, she's, uh, she's in demand for her award-winning show, Emmy, Mobile Evolution. And then in 2012, she was awarded a London Cultural uh, Unlimited Commission for Ménage à Trois, which was, which was created in partnership with Gail Sneddon and the National Theatre of Scotland that was, that was performed here on Wednesday night. She's just returned from Cambodia, looking at issues surrounding the prevalence of landmines in the country and the current situation of disabled individuals in Cambodia. And this research will form part of a new work, Pink Mist, that will be presented in Glasgow in 2013 with the Arches and the National Theatre of Scotland, and we're hoping will then come here. Uh, you'll have an opportunity to hear Claire again, I think, tomorrow, uh, in an interview with Wendy Martin, who's Head of Performance and Dance here. But at this stage, Claire, thank you very much for joining us, and over to you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so I was invited to make a, a speech to, to kind of bring this part of this event to a close. Um, hadn't really taken into perspective the fact that I was going after Jesse Norman and before Julie Walters. So um, yeah, no pressure there whatsoever. Um, so yeah, I'm coming. I'm going to come from quite a different place from Jesse. I tend to like to just talk about myself uh, quite a lot, as those of you who know my work might know. And um, and, uh, and I'm not going to talk about him at all. Um, which obviously, talking all about yourself in this context created a lot of questions for me uh, with the role of mentorship. So I'm going to talk about that flip for me. Um, so today I learned I was to have my first conscious experience of being on the other side of the mentorship relationship. I've been mentored by many different people at very different times throughout my life, but I've never been asked to be a mentor before. And I was quite nervous, to be, <laughs> to be very honest. Surely I'm not really equipped for this. All the mentors here were kind of sent out a little briefing note as, as guidelines, um, which when I actually read it, at first made me more nervous than, than, hell, than kind of uh, putting me at my ease. And this was some of the advice that we were given. Avoid offering your own opinions or giving advice. I just totally love blurting out when, when I get an idea or when I've just been containing myself at some of these extraordinary ideas that have been presented to me in the last hour and trying to kind of not go, oh my God, that makes me think of this. And um, yeah, I get very inspired uh, and irrational. But avoid making criticisms. Anybody that has ever gone to a theater show with me in their life will know that's pretty impossible for me to do. Do not impose your own ideas or interrupt. I am appalling at interrupting people. Be non-judgmental. Help them brainstorm ideas, including ones which may be slightly off the wall, like the guy, the skateboard dude. How on earth could I possibly sit in a conversation like this? And more importantly, how was I gonna manage not to talk about myself for at least 15 minutes? This is like some sort of reward at the end of it. I get to talk for 15. So just to give you a little bit of context, I've made my own performance work since 2007 working with movement and other art forms, but pre predominantly dance. My work has often been solo work and very biographical in nature, usually quite honest declarations of my own personal life. Basically, it's all about me. But last year, I was invited to make my first work on other people, a performance piece for 12 dancers by Kanduko Dance Company. And it was simultaneously the most terrifying and enjoyable work experience I've ever had. So reading the mentoring guidelines again, I then realized, wait a minute, this is what I do in the studio. This is what I did. What I mean is that this was the way I worked. I realized when I was making work on other people, 
Not so much when I make work on myself or about myself, because it's harder to have method and discipline when you're working on yourself or with yourself. It's harder to see what it is that you're doing wrong or right or not doing wrong or right when it's yourself. And I began to think that for me, this was what mentorship was kind of about, enabling you to look at yourself from a new perspective and a way borrowing someone else's eyes. And I'm just going to embrace a little bit of my Scottishness, in case you hadn't noticed um, here, if you'll indulge me. Because when I was thinking about this speech as well, and mentoring and how it helped me and how it's impacted on my life, the, there was words from a, a poem by Robert Burns that began to kind of go round in my head. It's a poem called To a, to a Louse. Really, a louse, yeah. Um, it was written when he was sitting in church and he saw a louse in the, ha in the hair of a rather well-to-do woman sitting in front of him in church. Um, so it's quite disgusting, but in a typical Burns way, he then finishes it in this quite universal and very beautiful sentiment from being about life. And uh, I'm going to do the Scottish version and then I shall translate it into the Queen's English afterwards. Or would some power the gift to give us to see ourselves as others see us? It would frame only a blunder free us and foolish notion. What airs and dress and gait would lead us and e'en devotion. Put your hand up if anybody understood that. Thank you. <laughs> But in translation, he's saying, Oh, would some power the gift to give us to see ourselves as others see us? It would from many a blunder free us and foolish notion. What airs in dress and gait would leave us and even devotion? And for me, this resonated a lot with my idea of mentorship in the various forms it's come in and out of my life. Partly my mentors have helped formulate a more real picture of who, I th of who I was and within the world and who I wanted to be as opposed to who I thought I was. As a person, I thought I was always inevitably trapped within all the negative aspects I could see about myself and indeed often could only see what I wasn't. I am where I am and who I am <laughs> right now which is humbly and gloriously artist in residence at the South Bank, in large part because of the succession of mentors I've had. I consider myself a successful artist, and by that I define success as being that I get to work at what I love. I get to connect with people through performance that I could never connect with in life otherwise. I'm able to earn a living by it, very mercenary but honest, and I get to choose who I work with and what I work on. And I'm very aware that not everyone is that fortunate. I think mentorship takes so many different forms. I think it can be a formal relationship with documented aims and outcomes, a paid agreement, and a professional service. I have my first experience of that in this last year of taking on a mentor who I had no personal relationship. It's a new, it's a new level of mentorship for me in this next year with uh, the artist Richard Lysel. But it can also be remote. It can be in the form of role models, I think. People who inspire us from so far away that we will never even meet. I speak now as someone who grew up wanting to be a classical soprano and listen to Jessie Norman and her contemporaries with awe, realizing that was what I wanted to do. And I worked towards it. I trained as a classical singer. I tried to go that route and then got madly diverted five years ago into dance. And though it's a roundabout route and unconventional, the reality is that two nights ago I was singing Mozart in the Queen Elizabeth Hall. And now I'm here in the same room as Jessie Norman, one of the very women who inspired me to sing, who inspired me to be an artist. The effect we can have even on those we never even meet is something particularly sacred for those of us who, don't work, who work publicly. Inspiring people, I think, is also mentorship. The mentors in my life, and there have been many, flow in and out of my life in different stages and often overlap. Some have simply been friends, unaware of the profound influence on me that they have had, such as my friend Rosie, who was the first other disabled person I ever met. 
So I was 18 years old before I met another disabled person. And my friendship with Rosie at university, I began to become aware of the idea that I was a disabled person, something I had denied and hated when I was growing up. I was incredibly ignorant about disability, and becoming friends with Rosie, who was outspoken and political, made me start to realize the ways in which I was being treated by society as a disabled person because of my impairment and my own conditioned acceptances of this. And she made me start to question that, to question my acceptance of my lot in life and began the realization of the importance of shared experience. And this was something that continued years later when I met Gary Robson, a disabled artist and producer who began to instill in me the importance of disability as part of my identity and made me want to take ownership of it, to grow from my teenage denial of it to someone who sees disability as an absolute valid form of life, not lesser, not negative, just different. And that difference is essential. That different lived experience is what gives disabled artists work an original perspective. And I have enjoyed embracing this concept and owning it by acknowledging that the work I make is informed by my lived experience, by my impairment. I would now never want to not be disabled. Other mentors in my life have simply been people I work with. And by working with them, by simply them doing what they do and bringing me along with them, I've absorbed their practices and their ethos. My best example is of working with Jess Curtis, an American choreographer. I was initially hired as a performer for a dance piece he was making, and I had no dance experience whatsoever. I had no interest in dance whatsoever. And Jess, rather than being put off by this grumpy young Scot that was absolutely, utterly, and in no way whatsoever going to dance in his dance piece, introduced me to movement in such a way almost akin to breaking in a horse, I can only imagine, got me curious. He saw potential in me as a dancer I had no concept of, but more importantly, he made me curious about my own potential. And that was the difference. He set me on a path of curiosity about movement and how I could move, so much so that it became an obsession that grew into an entirely new career. The other aspect Jess brought to my life was, like Rosie and Gary, to view myself from a new perspective. From seeing the potential for movement as he had, Jess also brought me to the realization that how I worked with crutches, even in an everyday sense, was unusual, even virtuosic. He showed me how my familiarity with my crutches from using them for so long had created a skill I knew these objects, I understood how they behaved, and I felt through them in the way that a circus performer might know their tightrope or their juggling clubs or their hula hoop. This shift in perspective from seeing my crutches as medical aids that I'd never liked to something I uniquely understood had blossomed into the stimulus for making work, something, again, never an intention for me. The recurring theme in all this is that these people have, by looking at me from their own viewpoints, but without judging or criticizing me, have shown me a new perspective on myself and on the context I am viewing myself within. So coming back to where I opened, now suddenly being on the other side of that relationship, how to take the role as mentor rather than mentee, here again is a shift in perspective for me and a shift in viewing the context I'm seeing myself in. So I then actually see that I know how to do these things. Avoid offering your own opinions or giving advice. Avoid making criticisms. Don't impose your own ideas. Be non-judgmental. Help them brainstorm ideas, including slightly off-the-wall ones. This is what I did, what I knew to do in a room of 12 Kanduko dancers for five weeks last January. It was my responsibility to create a safe, private space for them to explore ideas, to display them, to be honest, to be allowed to be vulnerable. It was my job to inspire creativity and curiosity from everyone, to offer options as to how their idea could be shaped, what direction it can go, and to show them that their ideas have merit and a right to exist. It was my job to hear or see when someone was not happy and to find a way to make that process work for them so that they could enjoy it. 
This isn't the way every choreographer would work. And some clearly want to just go in and work on the bodies in front of them. But I want to see human beings on stage being human beings. And I want them to have arrived at that performance through their own inquiry and not mine. But it's my job to interest, engage and challenge them in that line of inquiry. So in a way, in writing this speech, I feel like I've kind of mentored myself from one side of the relationship round to the other. I've realized that if I look at the idea of mentoring as similar to how I worked as a choreographer within a creative space, then I already know these skills. I'm still learning to refine them, but they're already there. I've kind of looked at myself through another set of eyes. As Burns said, would some power the gift to give us to see ourselves as others see us? I think it's about helping someone see what is already there inside of them. And I think mentoring is that power. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Claire, can I thank you so much for that a, a beautifully crafted piece of writing, actually. That was also part of it. Thank you. Um, and just to ask a couple of questions, because um, as we're, we're uh, about to bring Julie Walters on, I wanted to say that you... <laughs> I read a blog yesterday about bacon. Um, <laughs> it was about the fact that bacon has no interest in being written off the script because it knows it has a very important role to play, despite being processed. Anyway, um, the, the particular life experience that you have brought us today and the knowledge that you have and the impact of saying that your worldview is one that we need all to understand and learn from. That's a profound piece of commitment to, to education generally. And I don't know whether you now think of yourself not just as a mentor, but a role model. Um, yeah, I think it's the other way around. I think um, the mentor aspect is not something I'd ever um, really begun to encounter yet. Um, I think I've seen little tasters of the role model just because I, I perform on a stage with X hundred people and you go footage on Vimeo, you hear little trickling sort of bits of people, um, yeah, being, yeah, at the end of the day, if somebody turns around and thinks, I could do that, I could have a shot at that because they've seen a little bit of video or they've seen the show next door. Um, there have been little, little rumors of things like that and that's, yeah, that's what, that's what makes it worthwhile at the end of the day. Well, we invited Claire to be artist in residence because we are interested in her creativity, her intelligence, her courage, and the fact that she's so articulate, both physically and uh, verbally. And uh, we're, we're great. We're really, really pleased that you thank are. You. So thank no, you, Claire. Thank you for thank having you. us. Thank you very much. Thank you.